One of the most notorious subcultures on the internet is that of the furry community. Furries have been around for decades, their bizarre activities, artwork, and conventions being a source of comedy, bewilderment, and disgust for millions of online gawkers. And while most involved in the furry community are simply fun seekers with a shared interest in animal alter egos, the community does have a dark side. From furries committing bestiality, to revenge killings, to life-threatening gas attacks, these are the world's most dangerous furries. I want to give a big thanks to Warby Parker for sponsoring today's video. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores, offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses, and their glasses start at just $95. Warby Parker is unique in that their Try at Home program allows you to sample five frames of glasses before you even make a purchase. To get started, you take their online quiz that gauges your style preferences. Pick five frames that you like and they'll be at your front door within days. I really enjoyed having options here and being able to take my time and try out the frames in the comfort of my own home was great. Out of the five samples that I got, my favorite was the Simon Antique Silver Frames. These look great, and if you got a big ass head like me, they fit on the wider side, so these were perfect for me. Warby Parker is easy. Order a try-on kit, see what frames you like, and make a purchase. It's like having a vision center in your living room. So what are you waiting for? Try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. Remember, there's no obligation to buy. Ships free and includes a prepaid return label. Try five pairs of of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash wavy. Our first story involves a bioterrorism attack that occurred at a furry convention back in 2014. When furries were awoken from their sleep by a foul odor that was permeating the convention center hotel, police were notified and a criminal investigation soon followed. This is the story of the Furfest gas attack. To begin this story, let's go back to December 5th of 2014. The location, Rosemont, Illinois. The venue, Hyatt Regency Hotel near O'Hare Airport. And the event was Midwest Furfest 2014. And what was likely one of the largest gatherings of furries in United States history, Furfest 14 could be described as a religious experience for those in the furry fandom. The venue was flush with plush, with each patron donning their custom made fursuits and commiserating with their cartoonish companions. The furries listened to panels, bought and sold art, and met friends that they had been communicating with online for years. This is a big deal for a lot of furries out there. The fun would go on for nearly three days, but unfortunately, on the final day of Midwest Furfest 2014, a criminal element would enter the picture that threatened the entire convention. It was the early morning hours of December 7th, the final day of Furfest. Most furries were tucked in bed by this point, with only a few lone wolves awake still burning the midnight oil. One furry is returning to their hotel room on the ninth floor after going out for a smoke. But after stepping out of the ninth floor elevator, they're almost immediately hit in the face with a pungent odor that causes their nose to burn and their eyes to water and sting. And other furries that were sleeping would be awakened by this sudden atmospheric disturbance. Moments later, hotel alarms began sounding, and the confused furries now began to panic. As a result of this mysterious miasma, the entire building was being evacuated. This is a quote taken by a Furfest attendee regarding the smell. Quote, it smelled for all the world like the worst pool shock you've ever been around. Like it was eye stingingly bad, even outside of the hotel. As attendees exited the convention center hotel, they found that police and news reporters were already on the scene. The situation turned out to be a matter of national attention and was being treated as an active bioterrorist attack. Many furries that had been evacuated were being treated for exposure to the unidentified vapor. Most were lucky, only experiencing minor irritation to the eyes, but others weren't so fortunate. In fact, a total of 19 Furfest attendees were sent to the hospital due to health complications related to this apparent gas attack. Once all the furries had been herded from the hotel, police would storm the building, looking for the source of this noxious odor. And after performing a cursory search, they would find that source. It was a glass bottle that had been filled with poisonous chlorine powder. Someone had intentionally shattered this chlorine container just outside of the ninth floor stairway exit, causing dangerous chlorine gas to fill various areas of the hotel. First responders reported that the average gas measured resulted in 1.4 parts per million. 
According to the National Library of Medicine, one to three parts per million results in mild mucous membrane irritation that can usually be tolerated for about an hour. However, it's thought that the chlorine concentration could have been even higher in areas closer to the chlorine source on the ninth floor. Law enforcement considered this act intentional and would open a criminal investigation into the matter and started searching for potential suspects. Meanwhile, during the chaos, the evacuated furries came together and supported each other in this time of stress. One furry attendee even reportedly went to a nearby McDonald's and got McMuffins for the evacuated furries. When the going got tough, the herd of furries came together. At approximately 4.30 a.m., chlorine levels would reach zero and guests were permitted to return to their hotel rooms. With things returning to normal, the last day of Fur Fest would actually be permitted to occur and it went on without a hitch. If the Fur Fest terrorist intention was to ruin the final day of the event, they failed miserably. And in regard to the furries that needed medical attention, thankfully 18 of the 19 that were sent to the hospital had been released the next day. In regard to Furfest, all went well for the most part. The only confounding variable to this story though is the mysterious identity of the perpetrator. The identity of the Furfest gas attacker is still unknown to this day. Even after a thorough law enforcement investigation, the chlorine contaminator was never found. With police not being able to identify the culprit, this has naturally led to a lot of speculation online in regard to the matter, with there being many theories floating around postulating who could have done it. Many have pointed to a handful of prominent trolls within the furry community as being likely responsible for the gas attack. Their prime suspect, who I'll keep nameless, had allegedly brought a firearm to a prior furry convention, and some community members have alleged that this man once claimed responsibility for the attack itself. But even if that's true, these are only circumstantial leads. No real direct evidence has ever surfaced connecting this person to the biohazard contamination. And in all reality, it's very likely that any troll claiming responsibility for the crime had nothing to do with it, and they're likely just trying to bait reactions from the furry community members. Whatever the case, the Furfest gas attacker is still at large, and only time will tell if this mysterious individual faces justice for their crime. Our next story involves a depraved member of the furry community using deviant art to lure in a 12-year-old victim. This story begins with 21-year-old Mesa, Arizona man, Aaron Usury. Usury could be described as an internet-addicted loner and spent most of his days in front of a computer screen. A self-described artist and furry community member, Aaron was a regular visitor of a variety of furry fandom forums, but his favorite website in particular was none other than DeviantArt.com. Under his furry pseudonym Zell the Wolf, Aaron posted to the site frequently, sharing his furry artwork to the message board on a regular basis. Aaron's artwork was crude, derivative, and oftentimes contained sexual themes, with many of his drawings portraying his Zell character romantically involved with other deviant art furries. One image in particular shows Zell cuddled next to a wolf-like character that he had just bitten on the neck. The 21-year-old furry also created poems that bordered on melodrama, these poems indicating that the man had some sort of inner turmoil that he was going through. Time will tell. Where do I go when I just want to be okay? What do I do when nothing seems to go my way? I will sit here and wait. Waiting for... Dot, 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 dot. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Which, of course, brings us to some of the more questionable friendships that Aaron, a.k.a. Zell the Wolf, would make using DeviantArt. In some point in September of 2014, Zell the Wolf found himself becoming considerably close with two 12-year-old girls that he met on the DeviantArt website. These two minors were from Kansas and frequently spoke to Aaron online thinking highly of the man for his artwork. Initially bonding through their shared interest in furry fandom, the relationship would expand over time. What started with text chat evolves to voice and video, with Aaron conversing back and forth with the 12-year-old girls using Skype and Google Hangouts. It's said that in these calls, Aaron would attempt to counsel the young girls regarding their issues with school, bullying, parents, and depression. 
things that Aaron claimed he dealt with growing up. But let's be honest guys, I don't think it takes much of a rocket scientist to tell where this story was going, Zell the Wolf was grooming these 12 year old girls. During the later stages of Aaron's interactions with the 12 year olds, he would begin chatting explicitly, sending and receiving nude photos with the minors on a regular basis. And if that wasn't sickening enough, it's been reported that at one point, Aaron would send a video of himself having sex with the family dog to the 12 year olds. Yeah, the man filmed himself committing bestiality and sent it to minors. This horrific arrangement would go on for months until an adult would finally get involved. In February of 2015, the disgusting relationship was terminated after one of the 12 year old's mothers discovered the repugnant chat logs and videos. The mother would contact the police and a criminal investigation was open against Aaron Usury. On April 11th of 2015, Aaron's home was raided and the police would discover messages between him and the two kids and CP was present on the man's electronic devices. Aaron Usury would be taken to jail with the bond set at $25,000. Sometime later, Aaron Usury aka Zell the Wolf was found guilty on charges ranging from bestiality to luring a minor for sexual exploitation. The man was convicted to serve 17 years in prison with no possibility of parole. Since being incarcerated, a news crew has performed a jailhouse interview with the man, and this is his side of things. And I was able to help one of them through her cutting and suicide issues for a long time. I was making progress. And then over time, it became more about me and less about them. And that's when I lost everything that I stood for. Everyone seems to just take into, a, take into their own minds that it's not possible. You can't be in love with someone. Well, you can. Let them know, hey, I know that you're on the internet a lot. I know that this is really exciting for you, but but be mindful that there are things out there that you will want to avoid and hear what some of those things are and here's why we want you to avoid them. Despite his apologetic demeanor, I think the furry community and the public in general will be happy to know that this man is behind bars for over 10 more years. An online community that's closely related to the furries is that of the Wolfkin. Rather than roleplay under furry alter egos, members of the Wolfkin community believe themselves to actually be part wolf. And these Wolfkin individuals form packs with other Wolfkin in their communities and also uh, participate in these bizarre rituals to boot. <laughs> Arguably the most infamous Wolfkin community member in internet history is Wolfie Blackheart. This teen werewolf rose to infamy after the internet discovered she had allegedly decapitated a dog and boiled down its head. Believing the girl to be a degenerate dog killer, 4chan would launch a campaign to get the girl locked up. This is the story of Wolfie Blackheart. Our story begins in early 2010 in San Antonio, Texas. Around this time, a group of teenagers and young adults involved in the Wolfkin subculture had banded together to form the Crimson Blood Wolf Pack. This Wolf Pack served as a friend group with a twist. I mean, it's really more than a friend group. These people considered themselves family, a clan of wolves. And as with any pack of wolves, there has to be an alpha dog, and the alpha dog of the Crimson Blood Wolf Pack was a girl named Wolfie Blackheart. Very much immersed into lichen mythology, old social media photos from the time allow a glimpse into Wolfie's interests. One finds a bounty of photos taken of Wolfie featuring dogs, a room lined with animal skulls that she apparently taxidermied herself, and an overall gothic inspired aesthetic forming the bedrock of Wolfie's identity. Wolfie also claims to have an allergy to silver, which is known in werewolf lore to be a toxic metal that kills them. Like a lot of people would say, oh, you're allergic to silver. I personally am allergic to silver and nickel, but not all werewolves are. Like, it's an individualistic thing. Like, someone can be allergic to flowers, you know? In Wolfie's heyday back in 2010, there was a bit of a local obsession with the girl. The girl was not only charismatic, but she had a mischievous streak about her, adding to the mystique that would come to make Wolfie an enigmatic figure among San Antonio Wolfkin. She was also once arrested on a burglary charge. I was proved not guilty because I didn't do it. I was in the woods nearby, which I'm always in the woods. And uh, they caught me and my friend in the woods 
We didn't do the break-in. But in January of 2010, a shocking development would surface that suggested that perhaps Wolfie wasn't this innocuous Wolfkin influencer that most people thought she was. Late in the month, a photo would surface on 4chan showing an outstretched arm holding a decapitated dog's head. The photo immediately cultured outrage on the boards and prompted swift investigation into the origin and circumstances that led up to what was shown in the photo. Those familiar with the deep lore of 4chan know just just how seriously the community takes animal abuse, and the case of this dog head would be no exception. Members of 4chan created an IRC chat room dedicated to solving the alleged crime. In this IRC, many leads were discovered, and using EXIF image data and a deep dive on MySpace, 4chan users managed to trace the potential source of the photo to Wolfie Blackheart and a handful of friends associated with the Crimson Blood Wolf Pack. Names and phone numbers were eventually discovered, and this resulted in the 4chan community firing off a shotgun blast of calls and texts to these numbers in an attempt to get a confession for this apparent dog decapitation. This would prompt an anonymous associate of Wolfie's to come forward and give an explanation, and this individual went by the name Razor or Raz. Razor would pop into the IRC chat and comment the following. Everyone shut up for a set. Sec. Raz. Okay, I R Raz. No one killed the fucking dog. A truck running through my neighborhood ran him over. I tried to save him, but he died on the way to the vet. I'm the dog's caretaker. He was astray. I took him in. I hate my friends for defiling the body. They beheaded it. Dog died in a car accident. They just messed with the body. A purported subsequent phone call with Raz would reveal more information about the situation. Apparently, Raz claimed that the dog in question was allegedly a stray one of Wolfie's friends had picked up and had been caring for. The dog was given the name Shadow, and as mentioned in the IRC log, the cause of Shadow's death was supposedly due to him escaping his enclosure and getting hit by a vehicle. In this purported phone call, it's also alleged that Shadow was then given to some friends, unnamed in the call, to prepare for burial when it was reportedly later decided that the head would be preserved as a keepsake. And it goes without saying saying considering Wolfie's penchant for animal skulls, the head was then given to her to prepare for taxidermy. Seeing this as a tangible lead for real law enforcement, 4chan dug up Raz's real name and handed it and their speculations along with the IRC chat logs to San Antonio authorities and the local media. But things start getting even weirder at this point of the story because around this time, a woman named Kathy Silva, who was a nearby resident of Wolfie, she would come forward claiming that Shadow was in fact one point her dog and this dog's name was Rigsby. And one day, Rigsby just mysteriously disappeared from her backyard. This has led many to speculate that the dog was perhaps stolen by one of Wolfie's friends. But this remains unproven. It's very well possible that if Rigsby really was Kathy Silva's pet, he could have just simply escaped from her premises and was mistaken as a stray by the gang, then taken in by Wolfie's friends. Regardless, in the following days, police would do a bit of snooping around and discovered that Wolfie Blackheart was in the possession of several animal skulls. And they also heard that she may have been given the body of Shadow. Naturally, a search warrant was issued for Wolfie Blackheart's home. Police arrived and initiated a search, and inside the home they found none other than Shadow slash Rigsby's remains, the decapitated head now reduced only to a skull. The raid was covered by local media. A group of people mostly online have accused her of beheading a dog. I didn't kill any animal. I wouldn't. Like like I said, I'd be more likely to hurt a human than a dog any day. And even then, very, very, like, not really possible. I'm pretty friendly. The dog's name was Rigsby. He went missing on January 2nd. A photo of someone holding his head is on the internet. Now 18-year-old Wolfie is under investigation. I didn't get him as Rigsby. My friend brought him as her dog who got hit by a car named Shadow. And was he alive at the time? Dead. Dead. He was kind of stiff. Wolfie claims she's done nothing illegal. She says there's a group of people harassing her. They've even hacked into her personal accounts online. Now you have to ask yourself, was Wolfie going to be getting in any trouble for this? If the police could determine that the gang killed the dog just for the sake of taxidermying its head, 
Absolutely. Right to jail, right away. But if the story about the dog getting hit by a car and the owner simply wanted Wolfie to preserve the skull, that's a little bit of a different situation, you know what I mean? Wolfie has gone on record several times telling her side of the story, claiming that she did indeed decapitate the dog's head, but only did so after it was dead as to taxidermy Shadow's skull for the current owner, who was apparently a fellow wolfkin as a spiritual keepsake. I had got accused of killing and beheading a dog. I did behead him, I didn't kill him. He was my friend, his name was Shadow, and uh, he got hit by a car and they brought his corpse to me and they asked me to get his skull, so I did, but the owner's girlfriend took a picture of him and uh, they put it online and that's what caused all the fuss. Regardless, at the time of the raid, no animal abuse charges were being filed by the state against Wolfie, but the investigation was still ongoing. The whole debacle was quite the controversy and much conversation swirled online regarding it. Many believe that even if Wolfie's story was true, what she did was still reprehensible, while others thought what she did was honorable and respected her choice. Despite all the public outcry, there was no solid evidence collected during the police search that suggested that Wolfie Blackheart had intentionally killed the dog. It appeared authorities believed the story about Shadow being killed by a car on the road. Additionally, there was nothing to suggest that the decapitation of the dog was an act committed out of malice. While indeed disturbing and outside of the realm of anything you or I would do, the taxidermy of Shadow's skull was only done for preservation purposes, a bizarre wolfkin ritual to keep the dog close in spirit to their wolfkin owner. With all this in mind, it was ultimately decided by the state to not press charges and the investigation into Wolfie Blackheart would cease. In the wake of the controversy, Wolfie would begin to slink away from the public eye, but she wouldn't be forgotten. As after all the national attention, she became a living legend amongst Wolfkin nationwide. A cursory search on YouTube will yield dozens of tribute videos created by individuals participating in the subculture. These videos often take the form of slideshows featuring photos of Wolfie, the comment section full of fans idolizing her. And while there's many out there that look up to Wolfie, there's an equal and opposite group that feel as if a great injustice was served in regard to this controversy. Refusing to believe Wolfie's side of the story, some to this day accuse her of being a dog killer. Many point to the allegations that Shadow was stolen from its previous owner. After all, if that was the case, the implication of the taxidermy become far more questionable if the original owner was actively looking for their lost or stolen dog. Whatever the case, this strange story does have one sort of positive takeaway is that 4chan and the internet in general are always going to turn over every stone when it comes to these potential animal abuse cases. When two furry community members are forbidden from talking to a 17-year-old girl, the men hatch a dastardly plot to re-establish contact with the minor, a plot that quickly turns deadly. This is the story of the furry triple murder. Our story begins with the Yost family from Fullerton, California. The Yost family consisted of mother Jennifer, stepfather Christopher, and their three daughters, the oldest 17-year-old Caitlin pictured here. The Yost were a happy family and active members of the furry community. 17-year-old Caitlin took her involvement in the furry fandom quite seriously and even had her own fursona known as Daydreamer Foxwolf. She would use this fox wolf fursona online and at IRL furry gatherings. The Yoss would often participate in family-oriented furry activities, such as fur bowling events and a variety of furry conventions. And it would be within the furry fandom that Caitlin Yoss would meet two individuals important to the narrative of this story, 25-year-old Frank Enti Felix and his friend, 21-year-old Josh Acosta. Both of these men were linked to the community, with Frank Felix reportedly being a regular attendee of furry cons. While the exact circumstances of how the three met are unclear, Frank, Josh, and Caitlin would form a friendship. Frank in particular got close to the 17-year-old, so much so that furry community members often and suggested that something inappropriate may have been going on behind the scenes. The thought being that perhaps Caitlyn was being groomed by these older men. Caitlyn's interaction with these two men would go on for some time, but eventually the relationship between Felix Acosta and Caitlyn would come to a close after Caitlyn's mother Jennifer, seeing how close her daughter had gotten to these grown men, decided to step in, compelling the men to no longer contact the girl. But this wouldn't be the last the family would see of Frank Felix 
and Josh Acosta, as the two men would make a grisly return to the Yost family in the near future. In the early morning hours of September 24th of 2016, Fullerton, California 911 dispatch receives a phone call from a young girl claiming that an unknown man had broken into her home and killed her mom and dad. Turns out this caller was the six-year-old daughter of Jennifer and Christopher Yost. Police soon arrived at the family residence only to find the Yost parents dead. Both had been fatally shot point blank while sleeping. Additionally, a visiting family friend named Arthur Boucher had also been killed during this apparent home invasion. And curiously, Caitlin was nowhere to be found. Police would open a criminal investigation into the matter, and it wouldn't be long until they discovered the controversy that occurred between Caitlin, Felix, and Acosta. Naturally, the two men would become prime suspects, considering the recent falling out. The two were heavily questioned by authorities, and the truth would eventually surface. Frank Felix and Josh Acosta were both linked to the killings, with Felix allegedly escorting Josh to the Yost home in a truck, and Acosta entering the home and killing the family with a shotgun. Both were hit with a slew of homicide charges. Now, in regard to the motive behind the killings, you might think it's pretty self-explanatory. The two guys got pissed off at the family for the parents cutting Caitlin off from them. But court proceedings would reveal the situation was far more complex. During the trial, Josh Acosta's defense made a number of disturbing accusations regarding Caitlin and the Yoss family. Acosta claimed that the 17-year-old girl had convinced Felix and himself to kill her parents, accusing the family of multiple forms of child abuse. During the trial, Caitlin herself was granted immunity and would testify, alleging that she had been molested by her stepfather and confided this information in Frank Felix. And according to Caitlin, Felix was would use this information as blackmail to sleep with the 17-year-old girl. However, eventually it appears that the girl no longer cared to preserve her family relationship and decided to run away from home, asking Josh Acosta and Frank Felix with help in doing so. And according to Caitlin, that's when Frank Felix and Josh Acosta come to pick her up so she can run away from home. But I guess, you know, in the moment, one of the men decide the best thing to do is to go in the house and just kill the family to get him out of the picture to make the situation easy for them, I guess. Josh Acosta's defense team would blame Caitlin for the killings, saying, quote, I know she is not on trial, but she is the villain and the finger that pulled the trigger that killed her parents belonged to Katie. The defense would claim that Josh Acosta was autistic and he was unable to tell people's motives and just went along with Caitlin's apparent murderous ideas. Needless to say, the jury wasn't satisfied by the autistic defense. Whatever the case, the sexual abuse story was never verified, and even if that was the case, it doesn't justify you killing three people. Joshua Acosta was eventually found guilty of murder and was given three life sentences plus another 75 years. Frank Felix is still awaiting trial for his alleged involvement in the murder. In the time following this tragedy, furries held memorials for the deceased family and created a GoFundMe for the two daughters of the Yas and Boucher's daughter as well. The Yas children were also taken into the custody of a family member and were given counseling after the traumatic events. And what was likely one of the saddest tragedies in furry history, that was the story of the furry triple murders. Our next story is a disturbing case involving two fursuit makers. After the couple's mental health and financial situation enter a downward spiral, they soon find themselves accused of some of the most heinous crimes imaginable. This is the story of the fursuit killers. One of the most interesting elements of the furry community is the fursuits. Fursuits could be described as the physical manifestation of a furry's idealized image. The furry character they see themselves as and roleplay online made into a wearable costume that could be worn to gatherings and events. Now unsurprisingly, there's a lot that goes into making a fursuit. While some can be simple in design, the more custom suits require quite a bit of craftsmanship to pull off, and admittedly look impressive when well executed. And it goes without saying that a quality suit can be costly with suits ranging from, you know, hundreds of dollars to potentially like $10,000 for a well-made suit. With prices like that, it's no surprise that some turn to budget options when it comes to getting a fursuit. Some small-time indie fursuit makers are able to offer deals on suits, such as fursuit makers Vex and Jax, real name Jacob T. Berkowitz, 
and Tanya R. Dillard. These two furries were well known in the furry fandom and on occasion would make custom fursuits for community members. Under the name Lockjaw Arts, the duo offered their services, making relatively affordable fursuits of decent quality. The two reportedly made dozens of suits in their time as creators. But aside from their fursuit creation, the duo was also known for having a depressive social media presence. The two would frequently use Twitter to openly lament about personal struggles. Taking a brief foray through the individual's accounts, one finds many distressing posts regarding the mental health of Vex and Jax and updates regarding suicide attempts apparently made by these people. These personal mental health struggles would often get in the way of the duo finishing their commissions, and eventually their fursuit making business would halt entirely, with the story of Lockjaw Arts suddenly taking a bizarre criminal turn. In March of 2020, Vex and Jax reportedly posted an ad to Craigslist that led the couple coming into contact with Las Vegas man Hector Mendez Hernandez. Reports as to what exactly this ad requested vary, but I've seen claims that it was a dating style ad, but I've also seen reports saying that it was like hailing taxi services. Whatever the case, at some point during this interaction, Vex and Jax find themselves at Hector Hernandez's home and allegedly murder the guy. According to reports, Hernandez was beaten with fists, a dumbbell, stabbed, and shot. On the day of the killing, it's reported that Vex would contact a friend. And in this purported phone call, it's alleged that Vex would claim responsibility for killing and skinning a dog. When the shocked friend replied in disgust, Vex reportedly replies back with, quote, If you think that's strange, I'm sitting next to a dead body. According to this friend, Vex would then go on to explain what had happened, candidly describing the killing and how they had perpetrated it in great detail. The friend that the duo had confided in would notify police over the killing, and not long after, authorities would arrive at Hector's residence. According to reports, the couple would attempt to flee using Hector's own vehicle, but they would be caught not long after and taken into custody. The abrupt killing of Hector Hernandez by these two furries is a bit confusing at first, but after the police interrogation, interrogation, the story starts to come together. In a police interrogation, Jax would claim that they were using Hector as a ride to California, but at some point claims that Hector had inappropriately touched Vex. Apparently outraged by this, Jax says he saw Red and just started beating the man. So that was Jax's excuse for killing Hector. However, Vex on the other hand said that it was planned out. Vex reportedly told police that the couple intentionally used Craigslist as a way to lure in a random victim with promises of sex, only to then rob them after being invited into their victim's home. According to police, Vex admitted that after killing Hernandez, the couple had plans to take the man's car and live in the wilderness. Whatever the case, both were facing a slew of murder charges. While these individuals haven't been sentenced yet, it's safe to say that they'll probably be behind bars for a long time. It's a bizarre story showcasing two of the most deranged minds in the furry fandom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those were the world's most dangerous furries. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comment section, and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.